tables. In this nugget, we're going to talk about table design. So we'll start with normalization and denormalization, give you an example, we'll go over our normal forms and just get familiar with the process of designing a database. Then we'll get into key design, talk about primary keys, foreign keys, designing relationships, and at the end here we will cover table types and talk about the many different types of tables that we can use to design our databases. Let's begin. So what's the first thing we do as designers and developers when we get our hands inside of a database? Whether we're creating a new database or a database fell on our lap and we're going to be responsible for it, we're going to try to understand the schema, right? Either understand how it was designed or how we're going to design it. And at a high level, it's really just going to be one of two things. It's either going to be a normalized database or it's going to be a denormalized database. And you'll be able to tell that very quickly if you understand these design concepts. And they're pretty straightforward. So normalization is all about breaking our tables down into these focus containers to improve write performance. So that's why they're great for write intensive tables common in the world of OLTP, online transaction processing, where we have a lot of writes coming in to the system. So by breaking down tables, we reduce data redundancy and improve write performance. The world of denormalization is the exact opposite. So rather than shoot for many smaller tables, we shoot for fewer larger tables. And this is going to improve read performance because what's a, a big killer of read performance? You guessed it, joins, right? Joins can slow down performance. So this is a, a great design for those read heavy applications and tables commonly seen in the world of data warehousing and online analytical processing. So that's, that's the idea. We bring our tables together, increasing redundancy, and that's fine because we're generally not slamming a data warehouse with transactions, right? We periodically load it. So we don't have to worry about right performance. Now let's head back to normalization and cover our normal forms. So when we're designing an OLTP style database, we need to follow these normal forms, especially again, if we have a very write intensive database. Let's tackle our normal forms with a real world example. Let's say that we wanted to track users and their certifications. Now here we have a highly denormalized structure, two examples of one. And right now this breaks all rules of normalization. So we're in, we're in zero normal form here. And the reason we're in zero normal form is because we have repeating groups of data and repeating groups of fields. Our first example here is a repeating group of data where we have a certifications field that maybe is a common delimited list of the user certifications. That's bad. The second example here is a repeating group of fields because for every certification we have another column. So in order to get to first normal form, we need to follow three rules. The first rules is each column must contain atomic values. So in other words, none of this comma separated business here with certifications. The second rule is our column names must be unique. So none of this business here where we have multiple certification columns. And this is just bad design anyway, because if somebody only has one certification, we've got wasted space. And if somebody has 10 certifications, well, now we have to redesign our schema. The third rule for first normal form is that every table must have a primary key. And we do meet that requirement here with our initial design. But to get this truly in the first normal form, we're going to need to redesign the table. So here we'll make another user search table where we, we match normal form here because we have a primary key for the table. We only have our column listed once rather than multiple times, and we're not going to comment delimit it. So this does meet first normal form, but we still have some data redundancy because if a user has multiple certifications, they're going to have multiple records. But we are unique at the row level. Now, second normal form states that there must not be any partial dependence of any column on the primary key. And if we look at our first normal form table, we can see that first name and last name, they fully depend on the user ID. Certification could depend on the user ID, but description only depends on the certification and acquired only partially depends on the user. It also partially depends on the certification when it was acquired. So what this means is to truly reduce redundancy here, we're going to need a table for certifications. And so if we look at our second normal form diagram here, users is fully in second normal form because these fields only depend on the primary key. You're going to see second normal form really pop up when you have composite keys like we have here with our certifications table. We still need to know what users are associated with certifications. So we have a user ID, we have a certification ID. But if we look here, certification, is, this, this table is not in second normal form because certification only relies on the cert ID, description on the cert ID. Acquired is good because this relies on both the certification and the user ID. Users acquire certifications. So to truly get our certification table into second normal form here, we need to remove user ID and acquired. Now we have no partial dependencies and we just have a certifications table. Now this is where third normal form comes into play. And this is an interesting design because it's a many to many relationship, right? A user can have many certs, a cert can be associated with many users. So third normal form just pretty much states that there can be no transistive functional dependencies. In other words, all non primary key columns must depend entirely on the primary key. 
And we can see that with our junction table here, our middle table, because acquired fully depends on the full primary key. Users acquire certifications. Our users table is good and we've got a one to many to represent users to their certifications and certifications is good because we've got a one to many to represent certifications to users. And a great quote here, a great way to remember your normal forms is that the data depends on the key for first normal form, right? Row level uniqueness, the whole key for second normal form, no partial dependencies and nothing but the key for third normal form. And the result, a highly normalized structure with no data redundancy. This will remove any update, insert, or delete anomalies, and it'll also make it easier to modify the schema down the road because we have these nice small focus tables and, uh, and we've got all of our use cases covered. We've got users, we've got certifications, and we've got things that users can do to certifications all in their own separate entities. Now, something kind of cool and interesting I want to show you here is a denormalized design turned into a normalized design. And we're actually going to be building this out in some of our demonstrations here, our normalized version. But we built a course here at CBT Nuggets called Google App Engine. And Google App Engine underneath the hood uses the data store. The data store is a NoSQL style database optimized for read performance. So when you design against the data store, you shoot for highly denormalized structures. And the whole system ran off two main entities here. Users, what we call achievers, and achievements, which is what we call achievements. And just to give you a little background on how this works, the whole idea here is that we gamified life. <laughs> that anybody can go in and make what are called achievements. Achievements have a name, a description, a score associated with them. And achievers could achieve them, meaning they would get that achievement in their profile and their score. But look at this design here. In order to represent relationships between people following each other and achievers and achievements, we have comma delimited list of keys. So look at that. We'd, we're, we're not even in first normal form. We're breaking all rules of normalization because of the redundancy here within, uh, redundancy here within. but that, that's how this, this, the system works. And that's how you're supposed to design. And actually just to show you the site here and what it looks like, here's, here's what it is. So we've got achievements here with names, descriptions, a score, a contributor category when it was created. And here's a little achievement search engine here. So you can see all the achievements in the system. And then we have achievers, which are just users that go and acquire achievements. There it is, the whole thing. So that runs off of a NoSQL style database, highly denormalized. So we're going to redesign this here in our 70-464 course. So it's highly normalized and we've got to start here. So we've got users, again, achievers here, which contain everything about a user. We've got achievements, which contain everything about achievements. We've got user achievements, which are the actions that users can do to achievements. And then we've got users and followers because users can follow each other for email notifications when they create new achievements and such. So there we go. So the big takeaway here is remember denormalization is going to result in fewer larger tables optimized for read performance, not very good at write performance. Normalization, you're going to see lots of smaller tables that are going to be highly optimized for write performance, not so much for read performance. Let's talk about keys. We'll start here with primary keys. So the basics of primary keys are this. They're used to uniquely identify a record. Without a primary key, SQL that server would have no idea how to find a record to do anything to it. They must be unique and they cannot be null nor should they change over time. And a key can be either a single column or as we saw in a previous slide, they can be multiple columns, which would be known as a composite key. So the first decision you're gonna make when choosing a primary key is what do you choose as a primary key? You're gonna look at a table and you're gonna identify what could potentially be keys. Those are known as candidate keys. And there's a huge ongoing debate in the database world between natural keys and surrogate keys. Some people live by surrogate keys, others will jump over your desk, beat you up, and take your lunch money if you use anything but a natural key. And, and the real answer here is it, it depends. So first, let's define these. A natural key is derived from real table data, right? Just like we have over here, we've got real data in here. Customer number and social security number, those are candidate keys for this table where you could potentially use either one. So a customer number could be a system-generated number whenever a customer signs up, but it's a natural key. Right? It's, it's something that customers have. And same with the social security number. A surrogate key is not derived from real table data. It's an artificially produced value, generally one that's either incrementing using an identity column or randomly generated using a globally unique identifier column. And we'll talk about goods, by the way, as primary keys in a future nugget when we get into data types, because that's, that's another heated debate. Uh, but again, first order of business is just finding a key. And if, it's a, if you don't have a natural key in your data, then the debate's pretty much over. You have to use a surrogate key, and that's when you'll go on and decide what you should use for a surrogate key. But when it comes to a table that could potentially have a natural key, you need to ask yourself, is this key unique? Is it stable over time? Is it small? Because you generally want to avoid wide keys, and then you can go from there. How would we choose between our candidate natural keys here? Customer number? 
Maybe. Depends on the data type. Depends on stability. Is this something that's been around since the beginning of the system? Is this something that we're always going to have around? If it's an integer, uh, maybe it's a five-digit number, then it'd probably be a good choice. Nice small key. Social security number? Eh, a little bit longer, especially if we're storing the dashes. It's probably a character field, plus who knows <laughs> how stable that is. Maybe the government will ditch social security someday, and these numbers will... will change format or <laughs> cease to exist or maybe neither of these are good candidates and we need to introduce a surrogate key so you can see lots of questions but the big ones are is it going to be unique is it stable over time and what kind of data type is underneath it oh and that's another big question by the way is if they do change how big of an impact is that going to have on our system and all the consumers of our database so that's why i tend to lean towards surrogate keys just because they're a lot safer we're in full control of them but you know, sometimes that's just not the case. And uh, especially if you've inherited an old database that uses a natural key, then you're gonna have to deal with it. So that's primary keys. Let's move on to foreign keys. Foreign keys are how we set up relationships and those linkages between our tables. And how this works is we take the primary key from one table, duplicate it in another table, and that allows us to form the relationship. And that relationship will then give us all kinds of referential integrity options to see how this relationship acts. So doing this would give us a one-to-many relationship. The key is on the one side. Notice the infinity symbol here on this side. This just means one-to-many. We have one user that could have many certifications. Same on this side here. We have one certification that could have many users. Also note it's not possible to update or delete reference keys unless we set up cascading options inside of our referential integrity options. And also note that references are only checked between these tables if the column that holds the foreign key is not null. So what that means is, let's say we have another table here called user profile. So here's our user profile here. And let's say we've got a user ID in there and we store user profile. So their bio, their profile picture, all that. And our user table just contains core information. If we have a one-to-one -one setup between the user IDs here, if this is not null, that means these this data must exist in both tables. So a user must have a profile. If we make this user ID nullable, it just simply means that we could have a user that does not have a profile. So that's the idea there. And then our cascading options here on our link, we could say cascade delete anytime a user is deleted. That way their user profile will get deleted along with the user. Let's finish up with a quick overview of all the different table types we have when designing our databases here in SQL Server. So the first one we have is your standard traditional disk-based tables, what we're used to. So these are your traditional way SQL Server stores data. Data is stored on disk and 8 kilobyte pages is read to and written from disk. The reason we have that distinction is because we now have memory optimized tables here in SQL Server 2014, which uses the new in-memory capability. So we'll be talking plenty about in-memory technologies throughout this course. We've got a couple of nuggets dedicated to it. But the whole idea here is that the primary storage for these tables is main memory. And we do have a second copy maintained on disk for durability purposes. And this is really cool stuff and a great way to get more performance from our OLTP workloads by converting those OLTP disk based tables to memory optimized tables that are hit through natively compiled stored procedures. We also have a bunch of special table types out there. We've got temporary tables. These are great for processing and storing intermediate results. So we have local temporary tables and we also have global temporary tables. Local temporary tables are only last for the length of the connection that is using them. Global temporary tables last across all connections until the last connection using it, and then they get destroyed. Temporary tables are stored in TempTB, so it's just a temporary disk-based table. We also have table variables, which serve the same purpose as temporary tables. Uh, a temporary result, generally for staging or intermediate results, they functionally differ in a few areas. Temporary tables have a larger scope. Table variables uh, have variable scope, meaning they're only going to exist for as long as your stored procedure or script or function uses them. They both get stored in TempDB, so you're not going to see many performance differences between them. But the right answer is which one should you choose is really it depends on your situation. Test both of them out to see which one is right. The general rule of thumb is use temporary tables for large amounts of data. They make more sense and use table variables for smaller amounts of data. Partition tables are just awesome. This is uh, something that we'll be covering here. We've got a nugget dedicated to working with partition tables, but this allows us to take an extremely large table's worth of data and horizontally partition it. So we can take specific subsets of data, usually you partition on a date, so we could partition by day or week or month or year, and then we would move that data to its own file group and potentially on files that live on different drives than other data inside of the table. And this will bring with it all kinds of performance and manageability benefits because users that submit queries will only hit 
specific subsets of data that hit a specific drive. And then if we ever need to uh, archive data or push data off to a data warehouse, we can do a little technique called partition switching, which is a file-based operation rather than a transact SQL operation, make it very easy for us as DBAs to manage these subsets of data. So we'll take a big demonstration on partition tables down the road in this course. We also have system tables. This is where all SQL Server's configuration information is stored, so information about SQL Server. And we can access this information through dynamic management views. This is going to be very handy when you need to do things like get a list of all the databases on the server. Maybe you're writing a script that's going to loop through and back up all the databases. Super handy for stuff like that. There's also one more special table type that I don't have listed here. It's called file table. And file table is a special table for managing blob data. So blob data I'm talking about is that unstructured data, right? Images, videos, that kind of thing. And file table is built on top of file stream, which enables us to store our blob data in SQL Server or in the file system and have a reference to it in SQL Server that will give us transactional consistency. So it gives us all the options you would want when working with blob data. We can store it outside of SQL Server, but SQL Server will still be aware of it. And then we can give users access to it either through SQL Server or they can access it outside of SQL Server through maybe a Windows file share. So it's a great feature, and that's how we're going to be designing blob storage. And again, we'll get into that here in the future. In the CBT Nugget, we talked all about tables and table design. We started off there with normalization and denormalization, covered the differences between them, saw an example, and talked about our first through third normal forms. We also talked about primary keys, talked about natural and surrogate keys, how to choose a primary key, as well as foreign keys, how to set up relationships between our tables. And at the end here, we took a, a big look at all the different kinds of tables in SQL Server 2014. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.